Welcome to The Hot Dish, comfort food for rural America. I'm Heidi Heitkamp. And I'm Joel Heitkamp. Who's Joel Heitkamp? <laughs> okay, I'll say it differently. And I'm the Joel Heitkamp. <laughs> Joel, kind of like the Ohio State, right? Right, you know, exactly. Ohio, Ohio State tried to trademark the word the, and the trademark <laughs> office said, get out of here. So don't be getting any ideas about trademarking the Joel Heitkamp. You think Although I didn't I know already you know the that? the one and only. <laughs> you think I didn't already know that? I knew that. But, you but, know what? I'm, I'm really excited about this episode because a guy that I have admired for a long, long time agreed to do an interview, Steve Case. He founded AOL. And you might think, OK, you know, that guy, you know, he spun it off. I think they sold it to Warner. And, and you know, it's just like, OK, I'm out of here. I'm going to take my money and buy an island and go live well. No, what he said is there's problems in this country, one of which is there isn't enough venture capital coming to places across the country. There isn't enough entrepreneurship. I am going to invest my time, my energy, and my resources in building out opportunities in places like Cincinnati, Sioux Falls, Omaha. It shouldn't all go to Boston. It shouldn't all go to Silicon Valley. It shouldn't all go to New York City. See, and I think that that's one of the beauties of one country. I think more and more people are starting to understand that, that there's a middle of this country, too. Uh, and there's a lot of good people here, people that might not agree on everything, but are willing to talk to each other. And I think that's that's the great thing about being on this podcast with you, Heidi. Now, that's about as nice as I can get. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. I'll be nicer. Oh, should I say the Joel. Yeah. I'm going to just call you the Joel. That's good. I'm starting to dig that. I'll get shirts made. Because <laughs> nothing in America happens unless you have a t-shirt declaring it. Or a coffee mug. Yeah. Before the fun begins, there's a truly amazing young woman running for Congress in central Wisconsin. She's been in the state assembly for 12 years and boy, has she seen and done a lot. Her name is Katrina Shanklin. And I think you're going to be really impressed. I grew up in a small rural town in central Wisconsin called Wittenberg. It's a town of about a thousand, still a town of about a thousand. It was the kind of place where, you know, about once a month, my parents would load us all up in the van and we would take a 30 minute drive to the largest city in central Wisconsin to get all of our bulk goods and clothes and whatever else was needed, household items. So knowing what it's like to grow up in rural Wisconsin and then now to represent rural Wisconsin has been really special and important to me. I love Wisconsin. I've always lived in Wisconsin. Both my parents were public school teachers. Uh, so what I've learned about public school teachers is they're basically always on. They're always teaching you an important lesson. And my favorite lesson that my parents taught me at a very young age was when you see something wrong, instead of just complaining, you should really do something about it. So that's really, to me, what my call to service was at a young age is finding a way to fix problems and offering solutions instead of just complaining. So I ran for office in 2012 because I saw a lot of things that needed to be fixed. I was very disturbed to see the attacks on public education in Wisconsin. Then Governor Scott Walker came into office. Back then, the politics were called divide and conquer politics. We had one of the most gerrymandered electoral maps in the country. Wisconsin Democrats had lost in 2010, not only the U.S. Senate, but the governor, and both levers of power in the Senate and Assembly. And so we had the greatest losses more than any other state. So what we saw in 2011 um, was a pretty radical shift away from what I think is stewarding the public good, really caring about other folks. And watching that up close, I was working at a renewable energy nonprofit in central Wisconsin at the time. I was very concerned about not only the attacks on public education and the cuts to public education, but also the attacks on our reproductive rights, on killing the high-speed rail dollars, you know, that was hundreds of millions of dollars we could have used wisely, as well as even solar incentives. And so from my job at a small renewable energy nonprofit in rural central Wisconsin, I saw what can happen when a pretty strong policy shift happens in one go. And we had one of the most gerrymandered electoral maps in the country and, you know, 2011 to 2024, looking forward, I sure hope we get fair maps soon. And it sure looks like that will be the case. But I have personally lived under what I would say has been divide and conquer politics. And I wanted to fix that. 
I first ran for office in 2012. So I'm in my sixth term and my 12th year of service in the Wisconsin State Assembly. I currently serve as the only Democratic legislator in all of central Wisconsin and northern Wisconsin. So I have worked really hard to build coalitions, build bridges, and get things done. In my time in the legislature, I have passed 179 bills into law and counting under both Democratic and Republican governors, all while serving in the minority. So I know what it takes. When you have a good idea, you've got to get support from people of all political ideologies and you need to build not only bridges, but long term coalitions to get those bills signed into law. And I'm really proud to say that the bills I've gotten passed have been really meaningful for the people of Wisconsin, whether it's establishing our state's first ever community paramedic law so that we can deliver affordable preventative care to rural Wisconsin or whether it's delivering three new programs for farmers to help them with conservation and put more money in their pockets. I would say my focus in the legislature has been twofold. One is on investing in public education at all levels, and the other has been the intersection between environment and agriculture. So here in Wisconsin, we're very proud of our family farmers. We're really proud of our agricultural heritage, and we also care a lot about our public lands and access to clean air, clean water, and bountiful wildlife. I would say that that has been my greatest focus in the legislature. I've passed a number of bills into law specifically to help people struggling with nitrate contamination um, because here in central Wisconsin, in Portage County, one in four folks with private wells can't drink water from their taps. And so my goal has always been to move the needle on that, get people immediate access to clean drinking water while also focusing on long-term prevention that comes at the benefit of family farmers. We need people who understand the problems that people are facing every day, what keeps them up at night, and who aren't just listening to those problems, but have ideas for how to fix them, and who are willing to put in the work across the aisle, which is important because the margins in the House right now are slim. And so I am willing to work with anyone who wants to support common sense, results-driven solutions to problems facing the people of Wisconsin and across the country. I'm Katrina Shanklin, and I'm running for Wisconsin's third congressional district covering central and western Wisconsin, including Eau Claire, Stevens Point, and La Crosse. I have a special guest, someone I have wanted on this program for a long, long time. Um, It's Steve Case, former CEO, I think, of AOL and now has taken on a a real challenge in the country. Steve has initiated something that is very altruistic, in my opinion. It's called Revolution, a venture capital firm that houses Rise of the Rest Seed Fund. And that is something that really looks at how do we build the whole of the American economy. So I want to thank you so much for coming on. Welcome to uh, The Hot Dish, Steve. Well, great to be with you, Heidi. It's good. Thanks for all you've done over the many years for North Dakota and the country. And it's, it's great to be on this talk about what we're doing at, at Revolution and particularly Rise of the Rest. And communities now all around the country recognize more than they did maybe 10 years ago that if they're going to have a bright future, they have to lean into the future and be part of the future. And that includes being part of sort of what's known as the innovation economy. And they can't just rest on the laurels of the big companies in their cities that were created 50 or 100 years ago. They have to figure out what some of those new companies will be. And that requires creating a mindset around risk-taking and, and disruption, which for some is challenging, but it's really important. It requires figuring out ways to get some of these ideas, these startups funded including launching, you know, you know, kind of local or regional funds, includes talent, making sure some of the smart people growing up there, going to school there, stay there and don't leave for greener pastures. And the people who did leave maybe 10 or 20 years ago, at least some of them boomerang back to, to return uh, so that more companies can be uh, you know, launched. So it's a mix of culture and community and and capital and, and talent, but it all starts with recognizing it's critical for each of these communities to continue to lead in the future and it's critical overall for our country to make sure we really are doing everything we can to remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world and do it in a more inclusive way so more people and more places are along for the ride. Well, we talk a lot about kind of regional divisions and, you know, kind of the haves and have nots. And I think when people see the numbers on the kind of investment, venture capital investment going, what what 
90% to California, Washington, Boston, maybe some, some to some degree, D.C., they go, there they go again. They, they aren't interested in the rest of the country. And I know that you are looking at trying to encourage investment across the board. Yeah, no, I, I live this because when I started uh, you know, the company, I you know, co-founded America Online AOL nearly four decades ago. We were in Virginia and there was not a startup ecosystem in Virginia. There's no venture capital in, in, in Virginia. Uh, and it was hard to get people working at large companies to join our little startup company. Uh, so I lived it and then it was hard to get going and hard to really get, you know, get, get scale. And so I, I think that gives me some empathy for the entrepreneurs in Bismarck or Fargo or Columbus or Indianapolis or Pittsburgh or many other parts around the country uh, that they, you know, they, it's hard, they th think it's hard to be an entrepreneur there. And they often then do leave to go to some other place, usually, usually one of the coasts. Uh, and that's where we're trying to change. We're trying to change that dynamic so people can start companies wherever they are and create jobs in communities all across the country and deal with the issue that a lot of people in, in uh, North Dakota that do feel left out, they do feel left behind. They think a lot of this digital technology, all the things around the internet, social media, crypto, autonomous vehicles, AI, you name it, that's not helping them in their communities. It's actually hurting them. It's, in many cases, it's destroying jobs in those communities, not creating jobs. And some of that's always going to happen. There's always going to be a transition. I remember 100 years ago that 90% uh, or so of us worked in farms. You know, now it's, you know, 2% because we have shifted from that agriculture revolution to the industrial revolution. And, and, and now more people are, are obviously still people are working in farm, but far fewer. But le le we created new industry, new jobs. And we need to create new industries, new jobs all across the country. Well, and farms right now are more productive than ever with less labor. I mean, the, the autonomy and and technology has come to American agriculture, and that's not going to roll back either. No, and that's a, a positive, as you said. You know, the tech, yeah. technology, people some, sometimes view it as sort of the, the things that, that were, were jobs were displaced, and that is a concern. But exactly what you said, we, we grow more food in this country with far fewer people. And so you know, more food for more people to feed our country and feed the world is important, and doing it as efficiently as possible is also important, particularly given global competition. And that's the march of technology. That's the march of progress. We just need to make sure the benefits of that are more evenly distributed. It's not just a few places like Silicon Valley getting all the, the benefits, all the jobs, all the economic growth. It's 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 all placed all across the country. And that's what we're trying to do with, with Rise of the Rest. Yeah. And, and so how many times have we heard the exact same conversation you and I are having and people go, yep, we all nod our head. We need to do that. How do we do it? Walk us through some of the projects that you've done that you think have real impact in places that are not generally recognized as uh, as technology hubs. Well, I'll give you a few examples, but first, a, a little bit of a backstory. I actually got into this now 14, 15 years ago when I was asked to co-chair the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which was part of the Commerce Department. And we made a series of recommendations and one of them was the White House get involved in, in celebrating entrepreneurship. And uh, then President Obama did that. They launched the first ever startup day at the White House. All these entrepreneurs we brought in pitched to the president. Uh, and we, he also launched something called Startup America to, to try to focus more on regional entrepreneurship. And he asked me to chair that. And then I worked with him on the Jobs Council and worked on the, the Jobs Act that you obviously played a role as well, passed 10, 11 years ago to make it easier for entrepreneurs to access capital. So that was sort of the backstory. It actually started with policy, which really opened my eyes to this dynamic where most of the jobs are created by new companies under five years old. Most of those new companies, in order to really scale, need to access capital. Yet venture capital is, is really going to just a few places, you know, like Silicon Valley, New York, and Boston, not, not every place. Then about 10 years ago, we launched Rise of the Rest as an initiative. We traveled around the country by bus. We did all we could to celebrate these communities, do pitch competitions in these different, different places. And about six years ago, we launched a, 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 the seed fund, Rise of the Rest Seed Fund. And so far, we've invested over 200 companies in 100 different cities in partnership with nearly 400 regional venture capitalists. So we've really built quite a, quite a network. And a few of the examples, are, again, when, you, when there's 200 to pick from, it's kind of a little bit, I, 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 I'd usually duck the question because it'll kind of like asking a parent or who your favorite child is or a grandparent, who your favorite grandchild is. Of course, you love them all. Uh, but some interesting examples, we backed a company in Atlanta called Hermius. 
is building a you know Mach five technology. The Air Force is now a customer that, that you can you can get from Atlanta to you know, to Europe in in you know, ninety minutes, and it's obviously also helpful to the Air Force in moving things. That spun out of Virginia Tech, which was located in Atlanta. Maybe ten years ago, those Virginia Tech graduates would have gone to Silicon Valley, and they decided to stay in Atlanta and build that company in Atlanta. We also backed a company in Chattanooga called Freightways. And I didn't know this until we were there with our bus, but but uh, the, Chattanooga is where some of the biggest trucking companies in America are headquartered. And so building a company focused on trucking and logistics, uh, you know, which is what they do with, with data and media, almost like a Bloomberg for, for trucking and logistics, doing that in Chattanooga you know, made a lot of sense. In Arkansas, in, in Northwest Arkansas, in Fayetteville, uh, we backed a company that's focused on, on creating a platform to p- allow people to invest in farmland. So if you want to diversify and invest in farmland, you can you know, do that. The founder of that actually was in San Francisco working for a hedge fund in San Francisco when he came up with the, of, of the, the, the idea for this company and then decided to move home to Arkansas to Fayetteville to actually uh, you know, launch it. So those are just a few of the examples. You're seeing great entrepreneurs with great ideas, you know, the process of building great companies that instead of before feeling like they had to be in a place like San Francisco, now they think feel like they can be in Fayetteville or, or in Atlanta or in Chattanooga or in Fargo or many other places you can think about. Uh, and that's really, I think, bodes well for those communities and bodes well for the next chapter for, for our country. A lot of what you're talking about is individual, right? That The individual has a good idea. They see that opportunity maybe where they grew up. They see that opportunity where they want to live. And so, you know, it's kind of driven that way. I mean, I'm thinking about all the companies that I know that have been you know, innovative and creative, you know, people come in, they get gobbled up and then they get moved. I mean, that happens. And, you know, that's heartbreaking because what I see in several circumstances is these great ideas, once they're trying to get to scale, you know, to get to be that next big thing, it's really hard to take it without additional kind of investment. Big guys come in, they say, that's fine and good, but we, we think economies of scale work better if you move this thing to Boston. So if you were going to talk to communities and community leaders and say, what kind of ecosystem do we need to create within our communities to basically get um, uh, more sustained investment? Yeah, no, that is definitely the story. That Most of the acquisitions in the tech world 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, they acquire the company uh, often, then force them to to move to a particular location to consolidate their people in a certain headquarters, and so as a result, those communities were deprived of the you know the job growth that then then came from them. That started to change about a decade ago. Some of the big companies, Microsoft, for example, was a classic case of they said they they if you we require we need to move you, they did acquire Great Plains and. And Fargo, and decide to you know keep it there and build a build a broader uh, you know presence there. So that that was a, a a positive. And you've seen more examples of that where the big companies realize if you just move everybody, you lose some of the magic, you lose some of the people, you lose some of the you know the culture. The other thing that's happened is is you're seeing more of these companies get to scale, and then what's it's a, almost a flywheel effect that their success leads to other companies in Indianapolis, for example. Uh, a company called Exact Target was acquired by Salesforce uh, five six years ago. The time they had a thousand employees uh, of Exact Target. Salesforce now has two thousand employees in Indianapolis, so they doubled the size. It's actually, the second largest Salesforce office outside of San Francisco itself. It's 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 Indianapolis, uh, but more importantly, several dozen other companies focused on enterprise software have started now in Indianapolis, including some funded by the founder of Exact Target, some of the people that were early employees at Exact Target. So momentum begets momentum, and that dynamic is, is yep. happening. And the final point I'd make is the pandemic has been an accelerator, that there are obviously many tragic aspects to the pandemic, but one positive, if you're looking for kind of a silver lining, is it did lead some people to to move back home or to move to places they, they were thought of living but didn't think they could live. And now we're living in a more of a hybrid world. There's more flexibility around where you work and how you work and you know, remote tools and so forth. That's creating an opportunity for cities that to, to get, get some of those people back and keep some of the people who are, are growing up there. And so my message to the mayors, the governors, to, to, to people, community leaders, CEOs in those communities, is this is a moment and, and you should seize it. And uh, many cities are now focusing on this. The economic development is not about getting big companies to move anymore. It's getting new companies to start and scale. 
uh, and the cities that do this well, the communities do this well, are going to you know be the winners 10, 20, 30 years from now. And and related to that, it's 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 uh, important for people to know that there's a churning of companies. That about half of the Fortune 500 turns over every 25 years. So if you have a few big companies in your community. Good for you, but don't get cocky and complacent. Don't presume they'll be there forever because half of them won't be there. You better be launching some new companies to make up for the, some of the you know the companies that inevitably you'll you'll lose. So it's it's an exciting time. It's an important moment, and it's great to see things happening all across the country. And it's frankly also great to see your 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 former colleagues in Congress passing things like the Chips and Science Act, which included funding for tech hubs. And I think that could be a real game changer. Place-based economic strategy, I think, is, is increasingly important if we're going to not just win versus China and other countries, but do it in a more inclusive way. You know, you think about how the kind of collective thinking, if, if you get a, the right group of people who challenge each other, who work off each other, that kind of dynamic, entrepreneurial kind of dynamic is absolutely critical for this formula to work. And so you need critical mass. I want to kind of ask, maybe this is an unfair question to ask you, but if they feel like the dynamic in a community is not welcoming of their friends, not welcoming of their uh, um, brothers or sisters, uh, people that they know, it's it's awfully hard to get a move home. And, yeah. you know, so when you pass laws that discriminate against um, a group of people because of who they love, when you pass laws that are discriminatory in people's minds, it's awfully hard to, and my concern more is, will you be able to attract the talent? Yeah, no, I think there's different people assess things in different ways, but but certainly the, the, the policies that are put in place in different states are a factor as well. They might attract certain people, they might you know, alienate and turn off other people. People, when they're making these, these rules, these laws, should understand some of those kind of unintended consequences. And the way I look at it is, and from a United States standpoint, we've got to win what is now a global battle for talent. We need to continue to attract the best and brightest for all over the world to want to come here and start companies here because they're job creators, not job takers. They're, they're critical. Uh, and we also need to make sure we're winning the battle in, in each city. Every community is doing what they can to be attractive to the people who are builders, who, who are, are, are dreamers, who are visionaries, who want to build some of these companies because that's critical if you're going to you know, really create the the jobs and hope and opportunity in these communities that then attract other people. You get this momentum begets momentum flywheel uh, effect. So it's certainly possible. Many, many communities are really focused on it, which is more than when we got started 10 years ago. So I'm encouraged by some of the progress. Uh, but yeah, people need to recognize what are the things that move them forward that you know, help attract talent, help attract capital, help create a culture around startups and creativity. And, 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 and what are the things that might end up being, you know, turnoffs and alienate people. And, and, you know, you, you need to be careful as, as you think about these things to make sure that you also focus on the long-term impacts, including the economic impacts and in terms of what's happening with, with, uh, with things like jobs. You know, you've been at this over a decade and you obviously have a passion for it. I, I want you to think maybe 20 years into the future. What, what do you hope this country looks like 20 years from now? My hope 20 years from now is America continues to be in the lead. Yeah, I don't take for granted that that we're in the lead now or we have the leading economy in the world. We're the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world, but we can lose that. And so making sure we take steps to, to maintain that lead is important. So 20 years from now, I hope we are continuing to, to lead in new technology, AI, robotics. It's not China taking the lead. It's America continuing to lead. That's number one. Number two, we need to make sure we are doing it in a more inclusive way. I mentioned this, this earlier that the people that feel left out, the places that have been left out by the digital revolution in the last 20, 30, 40 years need to be part of it. And so having more of these companies start and scale in, in North Dakota and Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin and Colorado and Tennessee and, and you know, go down the list. So it's not just a few states that you know, right now 75 percent of venture capital is going to just three states, California, New York and Massachusetts. So you know, 20 years from now, it's it's much more dispersed. There's more capital and available to entrepreneurs in, in every city and every state. Uh, and as a result, more companies are starting, more companies are scaling, more innovations happening, more economic growth is happening. There's more economic vitality, which can make sure we lead, but also maybe in at least a small way, help bridge this big divide we have in this country of people who feel part of 
you know, what's happening and people who feel, you know, left out. And, and if more people have an opportunity to be part of the future, help build the future, I think that can also help bridge this, this real divide. I just want to thank you because you have been an innovator just looking at, well, how do you, how do you create a fund that represents those values and that ethic of growing the entire country? And I don't think anyone does it better than you. So if, if some of our listeners would like to learn more about the work that you do, or maybe even kind of engage with you, how would they do that? We have a number of websites. So revolution.com is our core site. We also have a rise of the rest site and I'm on you know, Twitter, I guess now X and other you know, social media platforms. And uh, so, you know, welcome, you know, we, 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 we like allies. We, we, we recognize we, we, you know, you know, revolutions happen in an evolutionary way. Number one, and number two, you have to, you know, build a tapestry of alliances to have success. So we, we love partnering with people. We love taking this idea, uh, to more people and, and we're trying to level the playing field in terms of opportunity, innovation, job creation, economic growth. And just like with the early days of the internet, we were successful because we built networks. We're trying to build networks with rise to rest as well. Well, the country is very fortunate to have you, Steve. Well, thank you. Thank you, Heidi, for your, this, uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you all, as I said at the beginning, for your leadership over so many years to help move the country forward. This is a part of the show where I have to listen to Joel preach about whatever <laughs> he wants to preach about because he thinks he's way smarter than me, which is, actually isn't true, Joel. Well, it's not true. I prefer to be called the reverend, but you go ahead. You call me anything you want there. I... I'll call you what dad called you. Yeah. Windy. <laughs> Little did he know eventually you'd make your living talking. Weren't you Weren't you the one he <laughs> called lazy? Went, I, no, no. He called me the fat kid. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Building my self-esteem for the rest of my life. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we have the intersection of football and politics. Um, at, at In the beginning, it was about Taylor Swift. She's registering a lot of young people, especially young women, encouraging them to use their vote as their voice. And that apparently is irritating a lot of the MAGA world. But um, unfortunately, and, and, and we could talk about that, but it's over talked about. And now politics and public policy and tragedy has hit the football world with the shootings at the Kansas City Parade. Uh, something that should be just a community celebration turns into a horrific and horrifying event. And ironically, and I don't think it was planned, on the anniversary of the Parkland High School murders. And so now football, once again, is, is intertwined with a lot of people's discussion of what to do about guns. And um, you you talk to a lot of people whose their most important amendment is the Second Amendment. What are they saying in the aftermath, Joel, of, of what happened in Kansas? Well, I mean, if, if you look at it, the big question with sports individuals is they fear that nothing like this can ever happen again. And, and that it, it is a real sad day because people are so passionate about their sports teams that they you know, the, you mean they, that you mean nobody's going to have a parade, yeah, a big event no, like nobody's this. Nobody's going to have a parade because when you go when you go to a stadium, you have to carry a clear purse. You have to go through a magnometer. You have to be go through security. So there's less concern during something like the game than there would be in an open air event like a parade. Well, right. You know, you, you look at the parade itself. It's you know, there was over a million people there including our family. You know, a number of members of our family were there and I had them on my radio show talking about it. And, you know, you sit there and you wonder whether or not people like that, you know, they've had three world championships in football and the Royals won. So they've been to four different parades like that you know, just in the last X number of years for them. And, you know, the, the, the plain and simple fact is not only will they not have it if the Chiefs win again next year, because you can't, uh, but our family wouldn't go. I mean, isn't that the point, right? They're going to drive them away. Now, I think this one is different, Heidi, at least, you know, the fact that, you know, you've got violence upon violence and, you know, this wasn't orchestrated to be some mass shooting like some of the others are. But I heard a quote 
that just stuck with me and it's still sticking with me now, which was what's more American than a Super Bowl champions parade and what's more American than a mass shooting? Yeah, I, I will say that the same nephew of ours who was in the midst of this horrific event also was in as a senior in high school sheltered in place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that just think so, of how he envisions the world versus how you and I did when we were his age. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really quite remarkable. But but it does raise the question of when something's going to change, when there's going to be a new look at uh, different strategies to protect people, different public policy strategies. I mean, that there are so many innocent people that get hurt when we don't take care of public safety. And these strategies, um, you know. Well, we're never going to have a real serious debate about what this nation can do with guns until both sides understand what a gun is and how it operates. I've been saying that for years as somebody who owns, I don't know, I own over 20 guns and uh, everyone for a different reason. Some for collectors, some to remember our dad, uh, some uh, to hunt with. I mean, I'm an avid hunter, folks. But let, let me just say this, that North Dakota, the state that I broadcast from, is a perfect example of how you should be able to reverse certain gun laws. There's a thing called a binary trigger, okay? Now, if you ask the left what a binary trigger is, they wouldn't be able to tell you. A lot of the Congress members that 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 come from the left side of the aisle and you said, okay, what's a binary trigger? They couldn't tell you. Well, a binary trigger lets go a charge. When you pull it, it shoots. When you let go of it, it shoots. So as quick as you can move your finger, that gun's going to shoot. Now, that makes that weapon into an automatic weapon. Now, we all know that automatic weapons are illegal in this country, but you know what? Semi-automatics are legal. So what happens in the state of North Dakota, where I'm from? They not only know that binary triggers are legal, which they never should be, but they codify it into code and put a whole separate piece of legislation that the NRA wants so that North Dakota recognizes in the century code that binary triggers are legal. What they didn't plan on when, when they pushed for that, what they didn't plan on was that we were going to lose an officer uh, a block from where I'm standing right now to a binary trigger. And I play that Perfect. sound over and over and over again on my show because I want people to hear what law enforcement is up against. You know that when they talk about ARs on the left, they oftentimes think about a look. They don't realize how it operates, how that gun operates. And until they understand how it operates and what separates it, they're not going to be taken seriously in the debate on what we can pass on gun legislation. And so Missouri's all, you know, it's the wild, wild west. You can open carry. You can do all of these things. Where I live, it's the same thing. You don't have to have a permit for this, that, or the other thing. And the only thing bad about guns is the fact that you can't carry enough of them. You know, there's no common sense as a gun owner, as a hunter, as somebody who supports, you know, gun rights up to a level there are certain gun laws that should and could get passed tomorrow if the yes. left understood what a gun does. So, Joel, can you can you hunt with a binary trigger? No, absolutely that, not. That, that's my point. My point is a lot of these guns, they're considered unsportsmanlike, right? Yep. Right? It, it's not fair to, you know, whatever you're hunting, whatever animal you're hunting. So they, we prevent people from using a lot of these same things that are now out in the open market. Well, a shotgun holds five shells. The average shotgun holds five shells. Okay. So, you know, when we hunt pheasants in North Dakota, game and fish makes you put a plug in it so that the most shells you can get in it are, are two in the storage chamber one in the, the, the gun itself. So now you can only have three shells, thus more sporting for the pheasants, right? And most people right. like I go with a double barrel because I, you know, if I can't hit them in two, they're already gone, kind of a philosophy. But I mean, here's the point. Joel, you never miss, do you? Not often, but here's the point. <laughs> I mean, but but truly, here's the point. They've got to know the weapon. 
you can't just look at a synthetic stock and say, oh, well, that's an AR. But Joel, by stock, you mean the tell people what a stock is. Well, stock is what the gun's made of that you Part put up gun, to your yeah. shoulder. It's 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 yeah. what the mechanism is built around. It's But that's the point, isn't it? If you look at the right and what they support, they don't get it either. The, these idiots in North Dakota that codified that binary trigger just wanted money from the NRA. So you're one of the 800 law enforcement officers out on that plaza in Kansas City, and you're up against this crap? That's what you're up against? Now, you and I both know that m most law enforcement officers tend to be more conservative by their thought. They're, they're more conservative. Mm -hmm. They're more for gun rights. You would think at some point they would get very, very aggressive at what they're up against. Joel, they used to be. When I started in law enforcement, when I became attorney general, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, especially as it related to things like red flag laws. We didn't call them red flag laws, but, you know, being able to to um, see that someone was dangerous, should not have access to weapons, being able to go in uh, and and do some kind of court procedure. And people would say, well, you're violating the Second Amendment rights. We're giving people due process. I have a great story. It's, there was a mom, she had a son who was troubled. He had mental health issues and she had been kind of taking care of him. And she got really sick and she knew she was gonna die. So she went to the state's attorney and the sheriff and said, my son should not have guns. She should not have guns. So they, in, out of respect for her, went to court, basically got the court to seize the guns. And she died. And about three years later, he comes back and says, I want my guns back. I want my gun rights restored. And uh, when the judge asks him, well, how are you doing? Are you feeling better? He goes, oh, I'm feeling way better since I stopped my medication. <laughs> yeah. And in today's <laughs> world, he'd get his guns back. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, we can't legislate a perfect world, but man, we are doing a really bad job le legislating a moderately safe world for our kids. And so, well, I, I, uh, yeah, we've I've got, got a story for you as well. Uh, it's a story of Officer Jake Walene, right? He could have been one of those eight hundred on that plaza wearing a Kansas City hat and his uniform, just because you know he wanted to be there helping out, doing his work, right? The, the guy that, that shot him here in Fargo, a block from where I live or where I work, is a guy named Muhammad Bearcat. Now, Muhammad came to this country legally, legally, went through every step possible, wasn't an illegal immigrant. It wasn't nothing like that. Came here, worked, uh, got uh, his citizenship, all of that. Got angry. Got angry right? Because he couldn't live his life the way he wanted, whatever. But here's the point to this. Law enforcement had been to his house three times. Three times. They got tipped off by the neighbors. They got tipped. He had an arsenal in his house. They knew it. And you know what they could do about it? Not a damn thing. Not, Not one thing. This guy was out to the rifle range here in South Fargo, and he was filling LP tanks with explosives. So he was touching off and shooting them, and the only thing that stopped him was that wasn't allowed at the range. He had those LP <laughs> tanks full of that same thing. He was going up to the street fair in Fargo. He saw an accident on 25th Street. He knew cops were coming. He pulled over there, waited until the cops got there, started shooting them. Wounded two, killed one, because he knew that if that was the case— then more law enforcement would come there. He'd go downtown to the street fair where he now had his vehicle plump loaded up to blow things up, to kill kids, everything. And here we sit. Here we sit. And we're going to defend well, the fact he yeah. had all that weaponry? Come on. Yeah. And, and more recent case, the, the shooter, young woman who went to jo Joel Osteen's church, everybody knew she had problems. I mean, you know, and so you're like, you know, the mental health crisis meets the, the gun crisis meets the opioid crisis. I mean, you know, where does the, it starts with the individual, but it also starts with the community and it starts with common sense. Were you were you happy that that mother got convicted in Michigan? Absolutely. And if I would have been on that jury, that would have been the shortest deliberation ever in the history of man.
I'd have walked in the yeah. room and said, I got to get home. She's guilty. Let's go. I mean, she was guilty. But, but I mean, I, I think my main point in all of this is people need to have a conversation just like you and I are having. And, and people need to be honest and say, well, that's the Second Amendment for you. No, it's not the Second Amendment for you. I would that love... That doesn't have anything to do with the Second Amendment. Thank God for people like you and John Tester and others, but there aren't enough of you. Because yeah. you're not well, going to get it all. You, you're going to have to pick away at it. And I get so mad okay. on my radio show when they say, well, how many lives did it save? You don't know how many lives it saved. Because nobody's saying, oh, by the way, I couldn't get a gun today because I had a waiting period, so I couldn't kill somebody. You don't know how many lives good gun plus, laws save. Well, plus plus a lot of this can, I mean, there's a lot of planning for people just like uh, this shooter in uh, Fargo, but a lot of it is also impulsive. And so the ability to to ask people to wait. It's a little cooling off for emotions. So, Joel, I want to ask one final question, um, because I know you always try and give something up for Lent. We're in the Lenten season. So what did you give up? Well, uh, you know, I, I gave up pop on Fridays. I gave up chocolate. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to make it to Mass more. And I'm going to, I always make it about the six Saturday or Fridays, I should say, of Lent. I... I go without beef or pork because I forget the other three, <laughs> you know, but so three out of the six, I usually make it. We're supposed to be eating fish as Catholics, um, you know, but there, there's no money in it anymore. Heidi, I used to bet all my friends that I could oh, give up okay. beer for, then hold on, Joel, hold on. Then... I used to bet my friends I could give up beer for six weeks and I'd make all the money and drive them everywhere. And now they won't gamble on it anymore. So, 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 um, in order for you to have a fasting or a you know spiritual, you got to make money on it. Well, the good that Lord works. gave you brains too, right? I mean, isn't that the whole? I mean, if He gave you the the brains to to make money, make money, right? Yeah. Well, Joel, I mean, you know, hopefully there'll be a lot of reflection, but you know, and I know, here today, gone tomorrow, it'll be yesterday's story. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, next time on The Hot Dish, we'll talk a little bit more about politics. But this is such an important topic. And I think it's more and more, I think, for young people, um, uh, this is a voting issue. Well, and I think we saw in New York in that congressional race that people are voting for different reasons than what the national media is saying they're voting for. So this might yeah. just be one of them. Well, thanks so much, Joel, for coming on. Till next time, we'll have... Uh, Lots to talk about because the politics in the country is heating up. And I'd like to spend some time talking about governor's races across the country. North Dakota's got a competitive one. I think we're going to see more and more um, as, as people look more and more to governors for future leaders. I think it's important to pay attention. I'll try to educate you there too as well. You all enjoyed that as much as I did. It's just fascinating when we have a chance to have a broad conversation about what's happening across the country in parts that uh, not a lot of people think about every day. So um, uh, once again, let us know what you think, and we want your suggestions too. So you can email us at podcast at onecountryproject.com. You know, and I want to thank you for joining us. The Hot Dish, you know, here, we're just glad you listened. Uh, the Hot Dish is brought to you by One Country Project, elevating the needs of rural America in Washington, D.C. Learn more at onecountryproject.com. We're going to be back in two weeks with The Hot Dish, comfort food for rural America.